I'll give you an example. The example I use when I'm speaking is, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many of you have walked into a room and said to yourself, what am I walking in this room for? Because we've all done that. But here's the difference. Walking into a room and forgetting why you walked into that room, that's one thing. Walking into a room and not knowing it's a room or where you are. You see, that is impairment that interferes with everyday living, and that is what needs to be checked. Welcome to Your Next Big Project is You, a podcast based around the theme of time. Time to be able to press pause on life. Time to reevaluate what's important. Time to reminisce about where you've come from, what you've learned, and what you've accomplished. Time to revisit your goals, dreams, and vision. In time to remember the people in your life. That's it, my friends. If you've got time, fasten your seatbelt and listen in as we discuss opportunities for the next five to 25 years of your life. And remember, your next big project is you. Welcome to our podcast. Your next big project is you. And I'm really pleased today. I've got a very, very special guest. Um, we have so much in common with what we've experienced in our life with uh, family and in our careers as well. And uh, welcome to the podcast, my good friend from Dallas, Texas, Jack Broyles. Uh, so happy Leo. to have you here, brother. Hey, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I was just flashing back as I was waiting to start on uh, you and I meeting at that at that. Uh, big conference in South Florida. My wife was there and you came and heard me speak and I stayed and heard you speak and we've been friends ever since. You got that right, brother. And it's, it's interesting because I knew of your family name, obviously, uh, from your dad in all the um, phenomenal accolades in his career from a, a, a original Georgia Tech quarterback back in the 40s to his you know, being drafted in his collegiate career and his, you know, 1964 Arkansas NCAA football championship. And then his yeah. story broadcasting career as athletic director at Arkansas. And so the Broyles name and the family name, um, something you got to be very, very proud of, my friend. Very, very proud of it. And actually, just uh, last week, we had the Broyles Award, which is given to the top assistant coach in the country. And it's the 27th year of the award that was founded in, uh, in honor of my dad because he had 27 coaches went through his staff and went on to become head coaches. Oh, wow. So, so TCU's offensive coordinator, young man named Garrett Riley, who is Lincoln Riley, who used to coach Oklahoma, now he's out of USC. That's sure. his younger brother. And Lincoln won the Brawls Award, I think, in 2016 or 2017. So... Both brothers, have, both brothers have won this very prestigious award as the well, top assistant coach in the country. And if I remember right, didn't your dad coach uh, Jerry Jones, you know, the owner of the Cowboys, and Jimmy Johnson, the the great coach uh, of the Cowboys, and uh, you know other teams uh, in his career as well? Is, is my memory correct on that? Perfect on that. Uh, Jerry and Jimmy came up as freshmen in 1960. Dad took over the Arkansas program in 1958. And uh, they were both on that championship team. Jerry Jones was a 195-pound pulling guard. <laughs> and Jimmy Johnson was about a 210-pound nose guard on the wow. defense. Yeah. Well, so probably, probably back in 64, considered to be, you know, big bigger guys on the team back then, right? But dad didn't want to have real big guys. He felt like uh, that, that well-coached smaller guys can beat the big guys and win the fourth quarter. We were well, down. They became big in stature for sure beyond that program's success. Yeah, and I know they I know they idolized your dad from uh talking to you over the years as we've uh shared notes and, and things. But but Jack, you know, let's talk about your journey. Obviously, following the footsteps of your dad. I know how much you love your mom and in uh, other members of your family and things. Tell us more about your personal journey, uh, what happened to you in your career. And I want to talk into some of the things that health-wise impacted your mom and then your dad and the, the difference that uh, your dad started to make uh, with authorship of a book and how you've taken that forward. So tell us a little bit about your journey, brother. 
Okay. Well, really, it started with me back in early 80s. I'm running a cable company in Greenville, Mississippi. <laughs> and on a career path that had a very short little finger on it and ended. But I met a wholesaler with Planco from, um, from Memphis, and he hired me as a junior wholesaler at, at Planco. And that started me on a career of raising money for money managers that I did for 33 years. Wow. And, and actually... And then, uh, then, and because of that, that really led me into what I'm doing now in that I spent eight years on the board of directors for the Dallas chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. My mother died in October of 2004, and by 2006, I just started volunteering at the Dallas chapter of the Alzheimer's Association for the walk and things. And next thing you know, I'm on the board in 2008, I'm, I'm sorry, 2006, in 2010, they, they elected me chairman of the board, which, by the way, the biggest mistake the board ever made. But, <laughs> but it launched my career because all of a sudden I went from being just a normal board member, being kind of a peripheral, just being tasked with the responsibility of making sure the chapter had enough money to do what we wanted them to do, which is help family caregivers with Alzheimer's. And so, uh, so I started... Uh, hanging around the chapter and meeting families. What I realized is almost no one is prepared for this disease, really not on any level, not financially, especially not financially. So I, I formed a little company called Jack Rolls and Associates. It took me two years to put together a training module for financial advisors and went for clients as well to get them to understand uh, their opponent. <laughs> you know, dad was a football coach. I heard him say many times, you cannot build a game plan if you don't know your opponent. Mm. So we spend a lot of time in both the, the FA training and the client training on getting them to understand who their opponent is, which is Alzheimer's disease. Wow. Wow. What a story and the difference that you're making, buddy. Uh, th th just to recap this. So you found out your mother had Alzheimer's. Uh, I mean, yes. did you see dementia first and then Alzheimer's? I want to talk to you about that progression of what you saw firsthand as a son. How yes. led into you getting raising your hand to say, I want to help here. Uh, <laughs> I, I believe I can make a difference to the evolution to your dad, you know, starting to say, you know, I can make a difference as well for caregivers. So Peace. tell me about when it first happened with mom and how that really changed your life in terms of the the difference that you've made the last couple decades here. You are so right about it changed my life. When mother was finally diagnosed in 2000, she was misdiagnosed in 95. And again, in 1998, back then they, they said, oh, she's just had some mild TIAs. She'll be fine. But now we know that it was those mild TIAs that were very likely triggered the onset of Alzheimer's. And so when mother was diagnosed in 2004, I'm sorry, 2000, Dad called us all together and said, uh, as a family, because I have five siblings. And uh, so he called us all together and said, look, your mother's been diagnosed with this disease, but there's going to come a time when she is not going to know who we are, but we know who she is. And so we're going to treat her just like she is fine. And I have a quick little story I'd love to share with you about that. Because in the last, in the last seven or eight months of her, of her uh, life, she kind of sat in this fetal position with her head down and her hands together in her lap. And, and uh, so I walked over to her and I said, okay, mother, I'm, I'm going to the grocery store. Can I get you anything? She didn't move. I said, mother, I'm going to the grocery store. Sure you want me to get you anything? She didn't move a muscle. So then I said, okay, listen, I'm going to the grocery store. You want me to get you some chocolate ice cream? She went, looked right up at me. So makes makes me realize that that our, that our loved ones can hear what we're saying and can understand what we're saying, but they, the brain won't let them process it and respond to it. Amazing. Wow, that, was, that was a huge revelation. Wow. So these are the types of things you're able to impart from your experience. Now your insight, your own wisdom to other caregivers, you know, through your speaking and things uh, yeah. to, to advise them on, these are some of the behavioral tendencies that you observe in dementia to Alzheimer's. Um, exactly. And, and it's really important for financial advisors because, uh, you know, people typically have the disease for a year and a half or two years before they're diagnosed. Hmm. And because they become expert 
and not putting themselves in a position where they'll embarrass themselves. And, and it also depends on how open the family is around them. But, but most people, when they're diagnosed, if the doctor's on point, they will say, I'm sorry to inform you, but your loved one has Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. And by the way, they've had it for about a year and a half or two years because I see where they are in the diagnosis. I see the memory loss and confusion. So what happens then is within the next year and a half or so, the patient moves into the middle stage of Alzheimer's. And that is when the tsunami begins. Mm. Because now they really, they've gone from having a pretty independent lifestyle the patient has to needing round the clock supervision. Yeah. Not care, but supervision. Because the risk is they'll wander, they'll fall, they'll get hurt, they won't know who they are, where they are. And so they need round the clock supervision just to make sure they they go for a walk, they go with them. You know, they can't go for a walk anymore because they'll get lost. They can't really drive the car anymore because they're having problems with visual and spatial images. But that's color, shapes, forms, and distances. And trying to drive a car when you can't really tell that's a red light or a green light out there. Uh, you know, my, my mother, my, my dad pulled my mother home from the airport one night when, and, uh, and she was, she was using, she would use uh, stop lights and stop signs. She'd pull up, stop red, red or green, and then go on through the intersection. And wow. after dad said, no more car, mother can't drive anymore. So, yeah. yeah. What age did, what age did it hit her check? Okay, she let's see, she died, she was 79. So it really she was diagnosed when she was 75, but we could we could look back now three three years or so. She really had it for three years before visibly had the signs of, of dementia uh, before she was diagnosed. So she she only lasted four years after the diagnosis. Wow. Yeah. I know we've talked about this before, and I that's why I have uh, such a big uh part of my heart that relates to this as i mentioned to you my father-in-law um who really wasn't didn't feel like a father-in-law to me really we became like almost one of my best friends and i, I remember i was sharing the story with you because it just resonated so much hearing about your mom and then your dad when my father-in-law who moved from connecticut down to florida for their so-called retirement got old got sick died but what happened the early stages when i saw it firsthand jack is when he pulled me aside we used to go golfing together we'd go looking at cars together we'd go look at a real estate together i'd go in with my wife and it was like you know her her father and i would bolt like within five minutes we were out doing fun things together and he and he pulls me aside and he confides in me we we're out golfing he said you know leo i'm having trouble figuring out how to get home from the post office. Wow. And right then it hit me like a two by four because I was starting to pick up some cues that he was starting to lose it a little bit. Well, when he told me he was at the post office and he was getting lost and confused and a couple of times didn't know how to get home. I knew that was the beginning of the dementia that had turned into Alzheimer's. And in my case, it progressed very quickly to the point with a very, very sad ending. You talk about supervision. I spent a night with him in a hospital in beautiful Buffalo here. And uh, he was looking at me like, what, what am I doing in this warehouse? Or, you know, taking him into a restaurant and trying to go to the bathroom into a sink. Or just not knowing where he was at. And you're trying to find, you know, talking into a mirror and dropping, you know, F-bombs. And he never swore in his life talking to some figure in the mirror who thought he was invading his house to, to seeing him, Jack die with a diaper on in a dirty nursing home down in Florida. Yeah. And so when I, when I, when you and I met and it just, it just said, man, this is a kindred spirit, Jack, who's, who's now seen it firsthand with his mom and then his dad. And I was relating to my father-in-law who I love dearly delivered his eulogy and talked about the, you know, that you saw the dignity and I, yeah. Jack, I was curious for your thoughts on this because my father-in-law would have looked at me and said, Leo, if I ever get to the point, I don't know my children, he had four kids or you or whatever, he, he probably would have, you know, I, I, he just put a pillow over my head. Don't let this go on anymore. Um, I, can't, you know, I can't blame you for that, but it was very insightful of him to say and tell you that he sees that he's having some problems, which is very profound. 
because typically this disease, what is so what is so unusual about Alzheimer's, why it's such a difficult condition is, is that yes, you're having memory issues, but this disease also affects your judgment, your reasoning, and your insight into yourself. So for him to confide in you and say, I'm starting to have some problems, it's very profound. My dad, who wrote a book on it, spoke all over the country, spoke for Congress half a dozen times, trying to get more money for research, never admitted that he had it. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> it's amazing. Amazing. You know, and his very good friend, Dr. Ron Peterson with the Mayo Clinic in Minneapolis, who actually coined the term mild cognitive impairment, MCI, is the one who diagnosed him. And he didn't blame him. Or he just he would never admit that he knew. Let me say yeah. that. Yeah. You know, the, the behavioral changes, Jack, that you saw firsthand with mom and then with dad, obviously. You know, I, I, I was trying to remember back on this thing with my wife and I, like, what's your dad doing in there? He just flushed the toilet like six times. <laughs> who's, who's he talking to in the mirror? Yeah. And, and you you have so much empathy. And you just want to cry, but you you're trying to laugh at the same time to find humor in what he's doing, you know, I'm, what I'm saying, there's a subtle yeah. balance of like, what's going on? And you just want to grab him and hold him so he doesn't get any worse. And, and, and so how, how can we, how do you help advisors to, and families to, you know, the cognitive changes where you're seeing it, especially advisors that you talk to when clients come into their offices or they're following up with them, what are some of the cues or things that you're telling them to be on the watch for? These are things well, that are early signs that are going to, you have to protect yourself and protect your client. What, exactly. what are some of those takeaways that they, that they write down when you're talking to them right now? Well, you know, you're looking for any type of behavior that interferes with everyday living. And I'll give you an example. The example I use when I'm speaking is, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many of you have walked into a room and said to yourself, what about walking in this room for? because we've all done that. But here's the difference. Walking into a room and forgetting why you walked into that room, that's one thing. Walking into a room and not knowing it's a room or where you are. You see, that is impairment that interferes with everyday living, and that is what needs to be checked. So that's really what you're looking for. And, wow. and, and the early warning signs are gonna be, I, I think everybody needs to understand that everybody that has Alzheimer's or any form of dementia, <clears throat> their disability is going to be short-term memory loss. Where are we going? What are we doing? Over and over again, just cannot remember. So you, so as advisors, I tell them, you'll you look for a client that calls in and won't know. So, uh, so I'm coming in on Tuesday, right? No, uh, Mr. Bowles, you came in last Tuesday. <laughs> You've already been in. Oh, okay. So you're, so you're looking for things like that and they having trouble understanding what you're saying. Um, and uh, confused about the money, you know, they'll start, actually it, it starts pretty early, even having problems uh, paying bills. That's really what got my mother. My dad called me one morning and said, you're not gonna believe this son, your mother called me crying this morning because she couldn't remember how to balance the checkbook. One day it was there and then it was gone. Yeah, amazing. So, and so right. And well, so, uh, but what is good about about the financial services industry is they have put some new FINRA rules in place that encourage the financial advisors that if they see any memory impairment, anything like that that makes them a little bit concerned, they are they are encouraged to have contact with somebody else in the family and let them know if they know what's going on. Yeah. So, it's in, it's interesting just comparing notes with you. Uh, my father-in-law thought my mother-in-law was his mother at times, not his wife. Yeah. My, my father-in-law, I remember being at a hotel with a family wedding and we where where is, I, I used to call him, I didn't call him dad. I call him, I gave him a nickname, Charlie. His name was Ed, but don't ask me. It was an old car dealer that we laughed about years ago. And that became a nickname uh, that I gave him. And we talked and laughed about it for years. Right. And it's like, I remember waking up. It's like, where did he go? He wasn't in the room. Yeah, he like he like like you talked about supervision and how he could hurt himself or whatever else. He got up early and was walking around the hotel. We didn't we lost him. Yeah, uh, that's amazing, isn't it? It's just amazing how 
you know, what this disease does. It just, it steals everything that you have. It's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, dad, dad was very high functioning right up to the very end. But we, I have a video of him. He was hallucinating <laughs> in the middle of hallucinating. Thanks. We just came back from being, being, beating Texas in a football game, which we had. We'd just been laying there. And uh, he said, well, if, if we beat the horns, we got to call the hogs. So my sister Betsy video, my wife Jane and I calling the hogs with dad because he thought we'd just come from a football game where, where we beat Texas. So yeah, yeah. But, but you know, but that you know, think about that mother. And here's another interesting point about Alzheimer's that we experienced with my mother is that mother one day saw herself in the mirror and didn't know who it was. And yeah, that exactly. frightened her. And it frightened her. Yeah. To the point that she made my dad take all the mirrors down in the house, except to the master bath. And dad says, Barbara, that mirror in the master bath is nailed to the wall. I can't get it off. And mother bought it because dad was still an athletic director in Arkansas the whole time. Uh, mother spent with Alzheimer's, so he needed a place to get dressed in the morning, you know, shave. Yeah. You know, the, so. there's something about the mirror, who they see in the mirror. And that's yes. exactly what I was saying earlier where my father-in-law would be swearing at this person in the mirror and like, get out of here. I'm going to tell you, I'm, you know, he was like, who are you talking to? And that's, you know, so the early it's from dementia to Alzheimer's. So what's the difference again? How would I net that out for somebody? Okay. That uh, that's a great point. Dementia refers to a gradually progressive brain illness that affects your cognition, which is your thinking and your behavior to such an extent that daily function is impaired. Also, Alzheimer's is a type of dementia in which memory and recall are the first and worst issues. Mm. So think of dementia as being an umbrella like cancer. People say, have been diagnosed with cancer. What kind of cancer do you have? Well, dementia is that umbrella. As this disease continues, people are going to say, I've been diagnosed with dementia. Oh, what kind of dementia do you have? Well, I've got Alzheimer's, I got vascular dementia, I got mixed dementia. <laughs> so there, there are about half a dozen different types of dementia, some of which okay. have so many letters in them, it's hard to start to pronounce. Wow. <laughs> but, uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, crazy. so when people, people advance to the form of dementia called Alzheimer's, correct? Right. Right. The, um, why is that so difficult in your mind to prepare for? It? Well, <clears throat> well, uh, well, uh, like we said, no two people experience Alzheimer's in exactly the same way because you don't know where in the brain it's going to start and where it's going to go next. And then secondly, uh, the big point is that uh, the point that I like to make is that uh, uh, I made some notes because I want to make sure that I, that I didn't forget about this, is that it just gets so financially out of control so quickly, as I yeah. said probably a year and a half after they're diagnosed, which means they've already had it for a year and a half. Uh, they, they move into the middle stage, and that's where they need around-the-clock supervision. Because of, you know, now they can't walk, they can't drive the car anymore, because the risk is the water they'll fall. They're starting to have difficulty now completing multi-step tasks, like making a meal, feeding the critters, cleaning up the kitchen, three, four things. Can't get through it or they'll get, they'll get lost or something. And, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing the kitchen. And they'll go back and finish. Wow. So it's just. It's so the, just, the, finan the financial um, concerns that arise. You know, I, I, I remember my mom being in an assisted care facility. And then there's other memory care units mm -hmm. and things like this now. So different forms of dementia or leading into Alzheimer's where they even need special treatment, uh, right. as you said, to protect themselves, to ensure wow. there's. Safety. It's one thing when you've got your cognitive ability and you could still be in a single room by yourself and go, as my mother did with her two sisters, um, and have dinner together every night. But when you've got memory loss or getting in worse cases of Alzheimer's, you need different type of care. Yeah. And, that, and, and you are so spot on about that. But interestingly, when you're talking about who your dad kind of thought you were and, you know, that that's is a window into how much their memory has receded. So think about, think about this. That 
you know, what we did 10 minutes ago, I don't remember, <laughs> but what we did last year, year before that, going back years, years upon years, uh, will give you a win into how old their mind is. Cause that's all the memories that they have. My, yeah. my wife's, uh, my wife's grandmother who lived to be 106 when she was about a hundred years old, she was pretty lucid up to that point, but, but she developed dementia and she walked into Janet's brother, my wife's brother and introduced herself as Dora Shelter, which was her maiden name. And she was a hundred years old and, uh, and got married when she was 14. So oh my she gosh. was already back. She was back to where she was at least 14 years old in her mind at that point. Wow. Hey, do you have a copy of your dad's book nearby? I do. It's right. Yeah, I do. It's right. You hold that up. Yeah. Hold yeah. that up. Yeah. So it's the Alzheimer's. I can't read it fully on. here, but it's, it's, Coach Broyles' Playbook for Alzheimer's Caregivers. And in, 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 it was published in 2006, if I remember right. Did 2006, I get right? exactly right. And they, they've actually just finishing up a kind of a upgrade to it. My sister Betsy had really helped Dad write the book. And uh, she was one that came in and took care of our mother. And so but that book is still a great story. We, Dad wrote this book thinking that he would share what we learned about caring for our mother and then share with his other fellow Arkansans. So uh, Walmart helped them get started. Walmart paid for the first 100,000 books that were printed, but Dan went through those in about three months. So oh now gosh. we've we've gone through about a million, four or five of these books that we distribute through the Frank and Bob Rolls Foundation, and we distribute them at what it costs us to print and ship. So that's the way Dan set it up. So the Royals Foundation is a 501c3, so they live off of donations. So I just tell people, you're going to get this for $6 a book, shit. <laughs> and uh, so we just like you make a donation to the foundation and make it. Okay. Just, yeah. And so that's how they continue. But my sister Betsy and her daughter Molly uh, run the Royals Foundation. They was that the dad found it to print the books. And they spend all day on the phone talking to family caregivers. Mostly Amazing. off the ledge. <laughs> you know? Wow. Hey, what, yeah. what was, what, so we rewind back, you know, we're going back a few years here, but what was the tipping point for dad that he said, I, I, I got to figure out a way to start writing this out to help other people to, to let them learn our experiences and, and what they can glean from this book that would better yeah. prepare them for dealing with their loved ones. Was there a tipping point that he said, I'm going to start, or I'm going to figure this out and write a book to help other caregivers. That is a great question. And I would, I would answer that. I remember the first time uh, the, uh, we were sitting at the breakfast table and mother was kind of losing it. And all, and all of a sudden dad just reached over, grabbed my mother's hand and kind of interrupted her and started telling her what a great life they had together and, and start talking stories about the kids and raising the kids and what they did together in, it really calmed her down. And I, and I went with you, a couple of my brothers and I were there, and we witnessed Dad taking Mother through this process. And then that began to be you know, what he would do is he would he would sit down, hold her hand like this, hand on top of Mother's hand. And that's the picture I used in the client a bit because I'm so, that is such a memory in my mind. But I really think that's what I think Dad realized there were things you could do to help people with Alzheimer's. And so, it, and so then he said, well, I guess we'll just put a book together that gets people to understand what the, you know, what the warning signs are. So what he does is he takes families through the three stages of Alzheimer's, helps you right. understand what, who your opponent is. Remember, you got to understand your opponent. You can't build a game plan. So you understand your opponent so you can build a good care plan for your loved one. But then he also tells you, teaches you how to how to keep yourself healthy. You got the, the caregivers got to make sure the caregiver stays healthy, or um, the patient's not going to get the kind of care they need. So wow. the caregivers got to. So they've got to be. You got to be able to have a break. I tell people all the time: if you're the only person caring for your loved one, you got to get help. You got to give yourself some time off. You got to decompress because it's it's so per Alzheimer's is so personal. You're just, you're watching your loved one disappear before your eyes and it's heartbreaking, but it's also physically demanding on you because people with Alzheimer's 
They sleep a little bit during the day, but they're up a lot during the day. They sleep a little bit at night, but they're up a lot at night. So wow. what's the caregiver doing? They're up all the time too. So, and that just puts, that just wears them out. It really does. Interesting. I, it, it probably builds on my last question here. And I was just curious when you, you know, that you, you got me emotional, just thinking about that visual of the hand over the hand. Yeah. Uh, it was prompting another question when I lost my mom and when my dad, I remember their last words. I, I was said, one of my, Blessings in life, Jack, was that my parents were with me at my birth, and I was with them at their last breath. Uh, yeah. So they were there my first breath. I was there at their last breath. And I said, oh, what a blessing for me to have such phenomenal memories of my mother and dad, who I love like you loved your mom and dad. When you, w- What's the final thought when you think of your mom, where that sense of pride and where there's an internal glow for you thinking about mom? Yeah. Uh, what's one or two or three things you think of when you're your lasting memories of your mother? The biggest thing I think about is my mom and my dad. And Leo, you know, I know this is going to be hard to believe, but my parents always, always showed a, a united front. I never saw them argue about one thing my entire life. Whatever mother said, dad backed up. Whatever dad said, mother backed up. And that was just amazing to me. And I think that, uh, that when, been watching him with that day started to take care of mother and realizing there were things he could do to help her get through these episodes of of uh, confusion and memory loss and confusion. See, people also they go like this. They're doing really good, not so good, not so good. Okay, getting a little bit better, a bit better, and uh, good again, not so good. So they just go up and down, in and out of reality, and it's amazing, and it. It wears on them. It's frightening to them, as you know. And I mean, to the point that you and I both discussed, my mother could see herself in the mirror and not know it was her. Right. Yes. Yeah. So it sounds like just a, a roller coaster of emotions, a yep. roller coaster of day by day. It could be a good day. It could be a bad day, right? Yeah. It it, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, the way it sounds. That's right. But, you know, we are finding that there are people who are very high functioning. And my dad was very high functioning. With Alzheimer's, like there are very high functioning people with other other conditions like Alzheimer's, which are a long term, very expensive, and always fatal disease. But dad was, he knew who I was. And he, people would come in, he would see him. So, uh, some of his old players would come in to see him in the last few weeks of his life. And, and uh, he could know, he would know who they were. And he'd be hallucinating and talking at the same time. It's amazing. There are some people who are very high functioning. Mother, Went down real fast. Dad hung on for a long time and was able to to do a lot of things. There were times when uh, at the Royals Award, they invited Dad to come up to the to the podium, and I went up with him one time, and he says, "I'm not going to speak, Am. I'm not going to speak, Am. I, I don't think I can do it." And I said, "Dad, you don't have to. I'll say whatever you want me to say." We got up to the podium, and he says, "I know what this is." He pulled that microphone, and he just started talking. <laughs> that amazing. <laughs> Ten you know, minutes later, yeah, yeah. So, you, you know what that reminds you of? Just rewind us <laughs> a few minutes when you said, "Mom, do you want any ice cream?" <laughs> yeah, right. And she looked right up at me. And she old. looked right up at That's you. True. And when your father saw that, I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh that man, was, that was that was such a revelation when she did that. So it shows you that uh, God it just helps you understand your opponent. You know, and then that's yeah, you, it, uh, which is all signs, which is a what, must. What would we give Jack? I've said this to people to have. Another day with our mom or our dad. Anything. Just about give up just about anything. And you know, when they're gone, and I've lost both my parents now. Both my parents are gone. Yeah. And, Same and, here. Uh, yeah, but I remember when a friend of mine who lived out in out in, uh, in California said uh, when his mother his dad passed away a long time ago, but when his mother passed away, he said, You know, I'm the head of my household, but when I need to get advice, who do I go to? My mom and dad, you know, my go-to people are now gone. Now I'm on my own. He said that was kind of a huge revelation to him. And I uh-huh. agree. With you about you know what, Jack, this, this is one of those uh, podcasts or discussions that I, I believe people listening to would say, I mean, I wish, I wish they could have just kept talking to, to see their <laughs> stories of mom and dads and, and things. And I, I, you know, I would come home, I'd pick my mother up, uh, it was about 60 miles away from our home here, beautiful Buffalo in the Rochester area. And as soon as you get in the car, 
in her later years and she would start talking and I'm, I'm talking about for one hour solid wouldn't stop <laughs> talking. yeah yeah and i and i and she never had dementia or alzheimer's but I, my point is that i would kill it feels like for another hour to hear her tell me the stories of the aunts and uncles and cousins and all the things that she complained about and things like that and to <laughs> have another moment with my dad the same way and to see my father-in-law, to have one of those joyous moments with him before he started to lose his mind and his memory and in those things. Boy, wouldn't you kill for one of those days oh, again? I sure would. What, what, what I miss most about Dad was that he retired from uh, from coaching and then as athletic director in Arkansas, sitting in the booth with him, and he'd be yeah, he'd be commentating. He'd, he'd say, he'd go, the left guard just moved, and then they'd throw the flag. <laughs> you know, and uh, he just, he could see it before. Oh yeah, he somebody yeah. else could and feel and, it. Uh, Dad and I oh. had a lot of special time together. He was a member of Augusta, and I and, and uh, so we went over and played golf together at least once or twice a year. And and uh, we really kind of got to be really good friends the last thirty years of our life, and it was real special getting to know him like his friends knew it. You know, my mother always said, "I wish you could know your father like his friends do." And I finally did the last 30 years of his life. Yeah. It was a real blessing. How blessed are you, man, to end on that? And, and so now people could call you when you're responding and traveling around the country. Are you traveling outside of the country to dealing with this? Or you're speaking at uh, advisor meetings, client events, and you're you're going through the process of education around the concepts of the book. Is that correct? Exactly. Just the way to end this for you? Exactly. Yes, we we I first set up a training module for Alzheimer's so they could understand their opponent, which is, which is Alzheimer's. So we spend a right much amount of time in the beginning getting people to understand what this disease is and how it does the damage it does to your brain. Got a little video that shows that. I show some a couple of MRIs what the brain looks like. You see the damage that the disease does to the brain, and uh, and so. Uh, so once they understand it, and then we give them some tips and strategies on how to help families. I mean, they know how to help families prepare financially for things, but there are some things about Alzheimer's that are, are different. And so I'll just make sure they know some of these little, yeah. little nuances about, about the disease. Oh. Yeah. Jack, you know, I know you've got many passions beginning with your family. Um, Jan, your kids and all that good stuff, your siblings, uh, these memories, uh, golf instruction these days, you know, things that yeah. you're doing to have some fun to give you balance in your, in your life. But what an extraordinary, you know, family story and how you've taken the, the baton forward, how proud your mom and dad must be looking down. It, the education, um, what you're giving to individuals that, to, to help them to deal with this, this illness, uh, this disease. Um, I, I can't thank you enough. It's just a buddy. There's someone who's seen it firsthand, but I've seen you speak about it live. And, I, and I've seen people listen to every word off the tip of your tongue, writing notes down, especially differences of dementia to Alzheimer's cues observations, things to look out for, people asking you questions. Keep your health, buddy. Keep making a difference. I'm privileged and blessed to know you as a buddy. And thank you so much for helping people uh, through the education and speaking that you're now doing to, to make a difference, to help families. One of a kind, brother. Hey, it's an thank honor so and much. a privilege. Thank you, Leo. Thank you very much.